Hey, welcome everybody. Webinar today. My name is Clay Malcolm here at Advanta IRA, and uh, I'm joined by Ray Catterley, and uh, he's going to be our our main expert speaker today. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, so, from a, a kind of a scheduling standpoint, I'm going to give a couple of minutes here about uh, self-directed IRAs and how they can invest in uh, in real estate investments, particularly today's focus of impact real estate investing. Um, and then Ray's really going to take over the, the bulk of the presentation um, and talk about the, the idea of putting together a real estate deal with, with some purpose and, and impact and things like that. So again, delighted to have Ray today. And uh, there are, uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type those in the questions box. You should have one in your console there for GoToWebinar. Um, we'll be answering those at the end. Um, you'll have both of our uh, contact information for follow-up questions after the webinar. Um, but certainly we're here to answer any questions that you have. So as they occur to you, please go ahead and type them in and then we'll we'll read them and address them uh, after the presentation. And uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> I'm here at Advance IRA. I, I've been in the self-directed IRA industry for about 10 years, uh, both as a professional, but also as an IRA investor. Uh, so I have a lot of understanding of how it is that that we choose investments and how we execute those investments. And uh, so I really I like working with people thinking about, OK, what's what's the best investment for them? How does it work? Is there anything that we need to keep in mind? So I'm always happy to be a resource for you when it comes to uh, thinking about a particular strategy or just talking about the mechanics of how self-directed IRA investing works. Uh, and you know, as a fellow self-directed IRA investor, I'm delighted to be here because I'm sure that I'm going to learn some, thing, some things from Ray today as well. So it's good for me. Uh, keep in mind that all the information today is for education purposes only. We do not give uh, tax, legal, or investment advice. Uh, we don't advocate any particular investment strategy or investment vendor. Uh, we're a really neutral part of the equation. Our role at Advanta is really to make sure that the account is... Uh, documented properly such that you get to keep the tax benefits that are associated with the account type. Um, make sure that the titling is proper uh, and that the custodial uh, part of the equation is is satisfied. Satisfied. So again, the, the IRS is, uh, understands that that money is tax advantage. Um, and we certainly invite you to bring your team with you. So that your financial team, whether that's your CPA or CFP, attorney, family members, whoever that is, uh, again, you know, with a self-directed IRA, you're really the de determiner of the account activity. So you choose the investments, you do the vetting, um, and you negotiate the deal. And so it's a, a, a different kind of a paradigm for some people, um, but you really are in control of what happens. We're there alongside you to make sure that the account, again, is documented properly. Um, but really, the, the key choices and the strategies are ones that you bring, and you can use your financial team to help you make those choices along the way. Uh, when it comes to Advanta, I'll just mention the fact that we, we based our um, business model around service. So every account holder gets their own account manager, as well as a, a, business, to person, a business development person or education person like myself. So you have kind of a two-man team at Advanta for your account. Um, we've been in the business for about uh, coming up on 20 years, about $1.3 billion in assets. We're kind of a medium-sized company in the space. And the nice thing about that from my perspective is that the we're big enough to have seen pretty much everything, uh, but not so big that you can't get somebody on the phone or have their uh, email address and get a get a response right away. So uh, we're kind of in that, that medium space and, uh, you know, again, built for customer service. And one of the things that I'll just mention as well is that, you know, one of the great things about working at Advanta is I, I do get to keep doing continuing education for my own expertise, not just about investments, which is also always fun. So I love doing these webinars because I get to talk to experts in, in the investing field, but also just in terms of what's going on and keeping up to date with self-directed IRA uh, legislation and changes and things like that. So Advanta really invests both in your education as well as my own so that we can uh, uh, have the whole operation run smoothly. Okay, so when we're talking about self-directed IRAs, what are we actually talking about? A lot of people think that self-directed IRAs are a, a different account type, and they're actually not. The accounts themselves stay the same, and they're the ones that you're already familiar with. So a traditional IRA, Roth IRA, 
uh, solo 401ks we handle. Um, a lot of times people don't know that their health savings account or HSA can also invest in this type of um, uh, private assets and, and uh, funds and things like that. But an HSA is an individual custodial account and operates very much like an IRA. Uh, and so if you have questions about that, you know, please feel free to ask us for some more detail. But these account types, again, they stay the same. Same contribution rules, distribution rules, and tax advantages, most importantly. And all we're really talking about when we talk about self-directed IRAs, or at least at Advanta, uh, a company that handles alternatives and private assets, is that instead of these accounts investing in publicly traded securities like stocks and mutual funds, they're going to be investing in private funds or real estate or precious metals. So the account itself stays the same. It's just that the asset that the uh, account holder is choosing to grow that account is different. So that's really the the main thing when, when we're talking about self-directed IRAs uh, is talking about alternative assets and the ability for them to be in your account. And so what are these alternative assets? I mentioned a few of them. Uh, you know, real estate is a big one, so that's that can be residential or commercial um, and, and all the varieties of commercial as well. Uh, we do things like cryptocurrency. Uh, private equity is really the way that a lot of funds are structured. But also sometimes funds have a, a, a private debt component to them as well. And so we handle all those kinds of private assets as, uh, as well. Um, we do do precious metals, uh, oil and gas. We do some agricultural investments. And really, almost anything is allowed in terms of the IRS and also our expertise. So, you know, you get to bring your expertise and your team's expertise to the investment strategy of the account. Again, we don't give any tax, legal, or investment advice, so we're not really there to tell you do this or do that, buy this, sell that. We're really there to take your instructions and help you to execute that investment and, again, keep the tax, tax benefits. And I put down your agenda on the slide today, too, because one of the things that I think is, is most powerful about self-directed IRAs is that it is the account holder that is the decider, and there, nobody else is really out there that's going to get in your way. So you get to exercise your own sense of due diligence, both from a financial perspective, but also from a social perspective or anything that you feel strongly about. So if you want your IRA to be invested in a certain type of asset or an asset with a certain purpose to it, you can do that and nobody can get in your way. Um, so it really is a, a powerful tool, both from a financial perspective, as well as from a you know personal perspective and what you want to be invested in and how you want to impact the world. And we'll be talking about that, obviously, you know, Ray's going to talk about the, the way that those funds get set up and things like that. But I'm here really basically to say that your IRA can be a participant in that type of strategy. So, again, IRAs do have self-directed IRAs do have some rules. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. The IRS is involved. So there are going to be a few things that you can't do. Uh, collectibles and life insurance are two asset classes that are prohibited. So those would be out. Um, and then there are some self-dealing rules, and basically those are centered around there's a certain set of, fo of folks who are considered to be disqualified persons. That's usually the account holder and their spouse and some close family members. And they have some restrictions in the way that they can interact with the IRA's cash and assets. And that things like my IRA can't buy something that I already personally own, or my IRA can't invest in a company that I that I work for or that I, well, I probably could work for them, but but that I own or control. So there are restrictions there. And, you know, if you feel like you're getting close to those restrictions, it's always a good idea to give us a call. And we're happy to, to give you all the details on the rules and what to expect and, and what to think about when you're choosing an investment strategy. So there are some rules. And it's one of the things that's nice about having a, a, an IRA custodian alongside of you because you can ask us, hey, what, what does the IRS think about that? Now, when it comes to participating in private funds, which we're going to focus on a little bit today, that's one of the, the really uh, interesting arenas because it can have some variability to it, right? That fund could be based on in all kinds of strategies. It could be buying real estate. It could be buying cryptocurrency. It could be buying any of those assets that we talked about before. It could be using debt or not. So there are a lot of strategies that, that go into the fund that you choose that your IRA is going to participate in. And some of them are, are really small could be an LLC that somebody or a limited partnership that somebody creates for a particular 
uh, real estate strategy or some small company. It can also be very large and diversified. So all of these kind of fall into the fund area. And generally speaking, when we're talking about that, that means a private equity transaction. So you're, you're participating with other investors and the, the nature of the, the fund or the entity can be, can be varied. Uh, some of them only take accredited investors. Some of them will accept both accredited and non-accredited. Uh, it really kind of depends on the way that the fund is structured. One of the things that we always encourage people to do is it, when their due diligence, pro due diligence process is to look at the level of transparency. How are they going to get information about how the fund operates? How are they going to know how their money is being used? Uh, how often do they get updates? And that kind of thing so that you understand the investment and that that investment and its returns work for you and your financial strategy. And that's that last box timing of returns. IRAs are a little bit different animal usually in as much as some IRA holders really don't need cash at the moment. If they're under 59 and a half and they're not taking distributions yet, it can be very patient money. Whereas if the IRA holder is over 60 and they need to be taking regular distributions, it might not be as patient of money. It might be looking at more of a cash flow kind of situation. So matching your funds um, goals in, in all of these uh, various aspects is really something that you and your financial team will decide when you're choosing how to invest. And it's really pretty easy. So the process is basically you open an account with Advanta, uh, you get some money into that account via a transfer or a rollover. Those are both not taxed and not penalized. Um, or you can make contributions if you qualify. So you get some money into that account via transfer, rollover, contribution. Then you go and you decide what investment you want to make, and you work with your account manager here and uh, and get the, the investment documentation uh, filled out accordingly, in other words, in the name of the IRA. And then we disperse the funds to close the deal. The funds go out of your IRA to the fund manager. And then any of the returns come right back into your IRA with the tax advantages of the account type. So it's really pretty simple. Um, lots of people are, you know, take an old 401k or an IRA that they're not um, feeling like they're getting their best return on. And they'll move some or all of that over to us and invest in private funds. And that's uh, kind of what we're going to be talking about today uh, with a, a slant of impact investing and purpose. And so I'm going to reintroduce my uh, my expert guest today, Ray Catterley of the Triple P Fund. And uh, Ray, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you the screen, Let's get the mechanics out of the way here. And delighted to have you today, and I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. All righty, I sure appreciate that, and thanks for having me on. Can you see my screen now? I see it. You've got it. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, I sure do enjoy this. I've uh, got a little bit of experience on a, a broad uh, range of uh, investing and investing activity, and I'll share some of those stories. And uh, we'll just dive right in because I know uh, everybody's going to, if you're on the West Coast, uh, this is uh, the start of your day. If you're on the East Coast, this might be what you're doing for lunch. Um, but what I hope to do is introduce a topic and then inter, uh, generate a conversation and uh, go from there. And that could be a conversation uh, with yourself uh, internally, and that could also be a conversation that you would have with others in the industry, maybe with your custodian like Advanta, maybe with other investors, colleagues, people that you like to pursue interest with, but something along that nature to where that conversation uh, takes place. And so today we're just going to have the introductions, uh, you know, who am I, why am I here talking to you, uh, a little bit about myself, and then impact investing definitions, a uh, bit about the history, uh, some of the basic parameters of impact investing. Now, um, I'm not a college professor on the topic of impact investing. Um, I am a fund manager for an investment fund that has that goal in mind. And so I did pull a little bit from uh, academia. And if you went into research the topic, I'm going to touch very briefly on a high level about impact investing. If you went out into uh, the Internet, uh, saw what academia was out uh, publishing, what articles are out there, you're going to get a real... A uh, good introduction to that, and then we're going to get specific. Again, uh, my main objective, other than introducing the topic, is to spark a conversation and get the juices flowing on what 
might excite you uh, because investing uh, can be very dry. It can be very boring. It can be very passive and something that's not satisfying. It can also be one of the most satisfying things that you do as an individual. It can be one of the most satisfying things that you do as far as building a legacy and how that takes shape. And I wanna plug into that uh, because that's the most exciting part of it. And as far as those uh, conversations go, um, uh, Clay, what I've done is I'm gonna leave my schedule open from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, for the next couple of weeks. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to me, just to either brainstorm, ask some specific questions, things like that, uh, you definitely can. And so I'm going to make sure. Before I go on any further, um, I don't know if I can get feedback on if my audio is working well. Yeah, I hear you great, Ray. Thank you. Okay, good. Just wanted to do that because we had a little bit of a glitch in the in the first part. All righty, perfect. And then um, a little bit of introduction about me. Um, you know, I'm a uh, I'm a dad. I'm a, a husband. I'm a real guy doing real things, uh, living a real life. Uh, I'm also a speaker and an educator, uh, business practitioner. And uh, these pictures out here are uh, are fun for me because all but three of them are actively pursuing real estate real estate investments and one of the examples that i like to bring out is that you know take the kids along take the family along take your friends along take your dog along uh maybe not your cat but because uh, that can be difficult but uh real estate is everywhere unless you're on a boat and uh, you got to dock it too and so uh, have fun get out there uh and enjoy it but uh, I do. And it's one of those things to where if you know the basics of uh, investment and the strategies that go along with it, it can be kind of dry to learn. It's like studying chess. Um, studying and learning chess can be very dry, but once you learn it, man, is it fun to play. And um, so, uh, Clay, I know you had some disclaimers along there, and I'll put mine up there as well. I am not an attorney or a tax professional. I am a fund manager and a real estate broker, and my comments are here to inform and excite conversation, uh, and I'm not giving law advice or tax advice. So impact investing definitions. I'm gonna blaze through some of these first uh, um, slides and then get a little bit more anecdotal and uh, storytelling, and then hopefully that'll open up some conversations with you, within your own uh, sphere of influence as well. But impact investing, uh, with, is investing with the specific objective of achieving positive social and or environmental impacts as well as financial return. And uh, there's a blended value to that where you can do a little bit of both. The combination of economic, social, and environmental value produced by impact investing activity. And so what I would like to do is introduce the, the question of what does winning look like if you were going to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish with your investing, uh, what one thing would you want to have happen? And then we'll get a little bit more specific uh, later on, but I want you to start thinking about what does winning look like? Because if you don't define it, uh, that intent, uh, then you might be working with somebody who thinks you've won, but you think you've lost and one of you is disappointed. If you're really clear on expectations and what you want to accomplish and you have that connection, then it can be very satisfying and rewarding. And maybe you work together uh, with a group, maybe it's your family, you all come together and you invest in a way uh, just like you would get together at Thanksgiving and do something uh, meaningful and purposeful, uh, investing can be like that for generations. And so, uh, again, I want to reiterate that it can and should be exciting for you. So, what impact investing is not. There's traditional philanthropy where things, money just gets given to a need. There's grant-based funding to social purposes, organizations donating money for maximum impact. Um, this would be something like um, an ongoing 
a food bank or something like that where a need is present and a need just gets met. Um, venture philanthropy invests in social purpose organizations with high financial risk in order to drive the organization's impact. Um, but it can be combined with one or both of these things. Um, what I want to make mention here is that, um, and I'll use my own fund as an example, is that we can work with these philanthropic organizations that give out grants to accomplish good, uh, to fill a need, to fill a purpose, a mission, and one of the things that can be done in that is work with a private for-profit enterprise. Now, that might sound a little bit convoluted, but what it does is these organizations that want to deploy capital to accomplish that mission and that purpose, they want to not just have a one-hit wonder to where they put the money out there, the need gets met that day, but they want to perpetuate that. And that is something that, if they can set up a business or an enterprise that is profitable and productive and doing that on an ongoing basis, two things can happen. It can be replicated, meaning if it's done here and all the conditions are same, it can be done somewhere else and somewhere else and you can replicate that same activity, that same positive impact over and over, uh, but then you can perpetuate it. It can go on and on and on. So where there might be a need today, you can meet the need today. Sometimes it just takes money and you push it at it. But if you have an enterprise, you can meet it for a long term. It's kind of like the old metaphor of uh, giving a man a fish and teaching a man to fish. Well, both are important because you need a fish that day, uh, but you also need to know how to take care of yourself on an ongoing basis. And so a little bit of history. Um, this reconnects a centuries-old tradition uh, that held the wealthy responsible for the welfare of the broader community. And there's several examples here, uh, and it goes back a long way. Um, moving forward into the mo more modern area, era, interest in social enterprises grew um, when somebody won the Nobel Peace Prize for creating uh, Grimian Bank. This was a micro lending uh, institution, and I'll, I've got some sources that I'll share at the end. Where if you want to take a deep dive and research into any of these topics, uh, you can have. Uh, I like to go hiking a lot, and uh, there's a trailhead at the beginning of every trail. And uh, if you're going to research something, I uh, which I enjoy doing as well. It's one of the things that really intrigues me. Um, my my kids call it going deep down the rabbit hole, and so uh, that I'll, I'll show you the entrance to the rabbit hole, so to speak. And so uh, again, I want to spark uh, that type of research and that type of conversation. And so the history is coming back around, and it's being more prevalent. And then um, I've got several notes here, so I'm going to be referencing them throughout, um, but uh, to make sure I don't miss anything, because there's some real good value here. But the consensus of what I'm putting out there is of several different reports. And so um, this consensus leads us to three basic parameters of impact investing. Now, this is a very high level uh, flight over a lot of different research reports. So um, I'm going to talk about these parameters and just know that these are uh, something that's consistent throughout if you're researching this. And then my purpose in sharing it with you today, again, this isn't a college level dissertation on impact investing. This is to help you go from a satellite view and then drill down onto the ground level and doing that through your custodian, through the investments that you find, all of those resources that are there to you. So um, three basic parameters, enterprise impact, social values of the goods and services and enterprises and management practices. Number two is investment impact. This is the investor's financial contribution to the social value. And then three is the non-monetary impact, contributions other than money that investors, fund managers, and others make to the enterprise's social value. And so the key thing here is the performance and the metrics and the targets. 
what are you trying to accomplish and then monitoring and managing it because if you don't monitor and manage it monitor and manage it it goes back to how do you know if you won how do you know if you were successful so there's three basic parameters the enterprise impact and there's some of these have a couple of layers to them uh, but they're again all at a high level of just thought provoking uh, introduction. So these sub uh, sub categories are product impact. What is the impact of the goods and services that are produced, and the operational impact, um, the impact of the management practices on employees' health, economic security, well-being to the community, or environmental effects of supply chain and operations. Uh, this could be uh, examples of the first one are uh, you know we've got. Uh, pandemic that was sweeping our globe and there's a cure and a vaccine that's out there that are all coming about uh, those were all through private investment and private enterprises and things like that um, uh, other examples are if there's just any type of a better way to minimize inconvenience and suffering and maximize our ability to enjoy um, our day-to-day -day life and to be productive uh, this could be uh, mobility um, 3D printing for a prosthetic, uh, any type of better mousetrap to where you improve the world around you and help others do the same, that's an impact of the product. Now, in the operational impact, this could be an example of uh, locally sourcing materials instead of shipping them in. Uh, in our fund, we're unfortunately having to ship in a lot of the materials that we're going to be using initially, uh, but we're also making arrangements to produce those on a local level. Uh, so there is the effort to make that transition and doing it on purpose. And that's one of the, uh, the parameters that we're measuring uh, is are we successful or not? Are we able to do that? Um, another quick story I like to point out is on the operational impact. I like seeing things where the people that are working within an organization, be it a company, um, manufacturing, production, anything like that, to where that person can also get a piece of the pie. I've worked for corporations that are large multinational corporations and they had a stock purchasing program. Well, if I owned a piece of it, then I got a piece of the profit. That was a little bit more distant uh, than I would have liked, but you know, I still felt like I had a, an ownership to it. A lot of these things feed the human spirit. If you feed the human spirit to where somebody who's doing a task uh, within a company actually feels the satisfaction of ownership, then it's gonna be a lot more satisfying uh, for both. Uh, the company is going to do better and uh, the people within the company are going to do better. And a good example of that, I remember as a kid uh, when we were traveling up to uh, family, there was a restaurant we always liked to stop at and it was an employee-owned uh, cafeteria and they were up against the wall of financial collapse, need to file bankruptcy, and one of the things they did was they just made it employee owned and sold shares uh, of all of the, the company to the employees. And my dad pointed this out and he said, I want you to make note of how the basic lowest level worker and employee within this business interacts with you. And then we'll go to this other cafeteria it's just, you know, a business, a franchise, and all they're getting is a paycheck at the end of the day. And it was remarkably notable. Uh, and it's something that uh, was an impact that stuck with me. And I think that's one of the paradigms that we're going to see uh, over the next several years is um, are things like that to where there can be that genuine connection between a business enterprise and the humans in the business enterprise. And so I really encourage that. And hopefully some of these ideas are starting to flow. So uh, the three basic uh, parameters, uh, getting in here with the enterprise impact, there's outputs versus outcomes. 
and then uh, this is the product or service or the effect of the the output in improving people's lives. Um, this uh, I'll give you a real good example for our specific fund. We're building homes, and uh, the output could be an example. Uh, Triple P fund will build 10 homes. Uh, the outcome might be that so many tons of carbon were sequestered in uh, building those homes and a community was improved uh, by some measurable note. So there's the output and then there's the outcome and measuring both uh, against the other is important. So an impact investor must have two questions as a basis of measuring their enterprise impact. To what extent will the intended output occur and to what extent will the output contribute to the intended outcome? Now, this is like, what are you doing and how much of what are you gonna accomplish along the way? And you need measurable data. And some of this can be in the example that, uh, that I used, uh, we're very fortunate in that we've got some specific data that we can measure. Tons of carbon sequestered, kilowatt hours of electricity generated through the use of solar, gallons of rainwater harvested, things like that, uh, pounds of food produced through urban farming. Those are all things that are real, mathematically measured. Other things are more uh, subjective that you have to conduct surveys, uh, then it's about the accuracy of the survey in collecting that data because you have to take an abstract thought and then turn it into measurable data. And then that's a whole nother topic. But one thing I want to point out too, as far as an investor and an account holder, uh, somebody deploying capital, the closer you are as an investor to the deal, the less you need data. If you're using your IRA account, your solo 401k, whatever it is to lend money to a uh, somebody who's going to buy, renovate, sell, or buy, renovate, hold properties in a blighted neighborhood, and then they do that several times over, and then you can see the actual benefit. You're close enough to smell the barbecue cooking at the picnic on Sunday. You don't need data as much. You know that you've created an impact and you don't have to measure it because you're not at a distance. So the one of the things as far as distance on uh, passive investing, you're gonna rely more on that data. And so one of the things that you're gonna to want to watch for is how does that line of communication flow? Uh, do they publish what they're doing on an ongoing basis to where you can actively be a part of the story and actively watch what's going on? Um, even though you're a passive participant, or is it something to where uh, your money is deployed and you never get to see it until the end uh, when the fund winds down and they give you a statement or something like that. That's also going to guide you on where you choose to place your funds in your capital. Uh, do you want that interaction? Or is it just like, I know what I'm doing, I don't need to interact every day. So that'll dictate the flavor of what you do. You might want to make those small loans to an upstart business. Uh, you might want to place your fund passively in a private placement or a fund. A lot of that's depending, or a little bit of both, I think is fun. So an impact investors uh, must answer those two questions as a basis of measuring their enterprise app, uh, impact. So on to number two, impact investment, it, Benefits that impact investors can provide, and this is just going to guide you on some of the things that you can do, and then I'm going to share some specifics that took place for me, and uh, you can do things below market investments, you can guarantee loans and pledge things, you can uh, have a subordinated debt or equity position. Uh, some of these are going to be familiar to you if you've done a lot of investments. If you're new and you're just getting into the active uh, IRA deployment of your capital, these might be new. These are some terms that you can look up, and we're not going to go real deep into them, but just know that there's there are tools in your toolbox to where uh, you're limited by your creativity alone. Um, you can have that purpose of accepting non-traditional terms to meet the enterprise's needs. There's uh, discerning opportunities 
that other investors don't see. And so again, these are only examples. Uh, there's a creativity that I want to spark because if you'll notice on those slides that Clay had at the very beginning, what you cannot do fit on one slide. So everything else you can do, and then just check in with them if you're evaluating something on like that. So I want you to be limited by your creativity alone and just really enjoy the creative process and the imagination. Even if you don't do anything and you spark this as something that's uh, something you want to look at for a while and evaluate for a while, I think it'll be really enjoying, enjoyable for you. So non-monetary impact. Uh, this is improve the social output by providing non-monetary benefits. This is improving and enabling the environment for social enterprises investors. Um, this is uh, finding and providing impact investment opportunities, um, aggregating the capital. Um, now, on each of these, you know, those can sound like big lofty sentences, but starting here at number two, where you've got finding and providing the impact, that's the visionary. Uh, that's the one who has the idea. Um, and we've got a slow network connection. So your your audio sounds fine, but your, your video is frozen, Ray. So maybe you want to okay. just go on, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll let it, uh, let it do that. I'm going to stick on this slide um, and just go through these points and uh, jump in and let me know if it uh, does or does not. Uh, come back up, but the the first one on providing an environment for social enterprise, I would put one word by that, and that's leader. Uh, you can provide leadership to help create that environment for things to actually happen. Uh, the finding and providing the impact, that's what you're actually going to do. That's the visionary. Uh, there needs to be an idea. On number three here, you can aggregate capital and provide other investment services. Uh, that's basically being a CFO. You know, if you're the one who's helping make those financial decisions, and then I'm hoping these titles and positions help um, stimulate these thoughts is like, oh, hey, I have an aptitude as a CFO, but I'm not the leader. Well, then now you're going to know how to plug in your mindset into how you evaluate a, a certain scenario and maybe look for opportunities to where you can actively be a, a part of something. Uh, moving on down, number four, providing technical uh, governance assistance to enterprises. You could be a consultant or a mentor. Um, number five is recruiting investors. Um, everybody knows somebody. If there's something that you like to do, something you're passionate about it, um, I could tell you to not talk about it and I'd probably have a hard time getting you to not talk about it and be quiet. So once you find something that's passionate, uh, it's really fun to share. And recruiting other investors is just storytelling, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it once you find your niche into it all. Um, securing and protecting the enterprise's social mission. Um, I, uh, my family, uh, I shared the story about how uh, I like a lot of different topics and go down a lot of different rabbit holes. And I have to surround myself with people who will keep me on point. And, uh, and I have those things written and in writing and appointments set to measure them on purpose because I do enjoy a lot of different uh, things, researching a lot of different topics, uh, as I feel everyone should. But uh, if uh, you either know someone who needs to be kept on point or you are the one who keeps people on point, both of you are important and enjoy the process. Just know who you are and how it relates to your impact investing. This is one of the last ones of the uh, uh, the slides that I've got as far as introduction, and then I'll get into some uh, some more of the stories. But number three, the non-monetary impact, quantifying non-monetary impact, and then does the activity increase the quantity or quality of social values? outputs produced compared to what would otherwise have occurred? If so, how much? This is a little bit redundant, but it also just puts a period on the end of the sentence. And uh, and just consider your willingness to pay for services, uh, finding the opportunities, doing your due diligence. Are you willing to do all of this? And do you have the time and the resources? And then uh, lastly, the enterprise's willingness to pay for the technical assistance. So here are some trends. And um, I'll just sum it up that 
uh, impact investing has made a big splash and it is only getting bigger. And if you talk to any investors who are 25 to 35, uh, they are going to blow it wide open. Uh, they really have a focus. I'm talking to financial planners that are seeking me out because they want to talk because they see things happening. And uh, impact investing is here, and it is one of the paradigms that I think is going to be a part of the landscape that is going to influence a lot of good and a lot of change. So why impact investing? Again, I mentioned it before, shifting paradigms, uh, diverse and viable opportunities. It does nothing but create opportunities. And then uh, that environment is where people can flourish. Who is making these uh, impact investments? Fund managers like myself. Uh, private foundations. I mentioned that a fund, a for-profit fund, can work with a private foundation, uh, even in a grant basis. Uh, pension funds and insurance companies, uh, that's more on a large macro scale. Uh, these are uh, stocks, uh, companies that are focused on things like that. And it might be a guiding principle and something they check in on. This is individual investors. Uh, this is someone where you can do right on the grassroots and do something at ground level that nobody else could do. Uh, you have a lot of power and influence and really enjoy the, the thought on how to wield that and how to deploy that into the world. Uh, there's religious institutions. Uh, you see this in a lot of hospitals and a lot of charitable uh, uh, ventures that go across the globe and there's many more and I just would encourage you to plug in which one is you. Um, how to impact investments perform? They have to perform realistically. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this slide but it just illustrates the growth of impact and how it's increasing and also just that uh, the returns have to be reasonable and they have to be competitive. So there's a few cautions I want to slip in uh, right here because you can get all this optimism and you want to go do something and then there can be some unintended consequence. I've met with experts in this area where uh, I was sharing something that I wanted to do and they just totally redirected me and said, uh, make sure that you don't siphon money out of a neighborhood. Uh, do create local loops. Any dollar that can circulate within a community multiple times will be far more influential and far more impactful than just one and done profit and something gets accomplished. Um, another caution is watch for impact washing. Uh, if everybody's wanting to invest for impact, um, if I'm recruiting investment money, I'm going to say, hey, look what we do. Uh, make sure that you know how to drill deep into uh, looking through that and actually what's being accomplished. See, genuine connections. Uh, this is one of the things that I think is missing uh, the most in our society, in our world, and that's through uh, the presence of technology. We're very, very connected, but yet we're very disconnected. Uh, the, the virus and pandemic shut us all indoors and disconnected us from one another. And I think one of the things that people want the most right now is a genuine connection. And this is one great way to make it. And I would caution you to not do a, an investment like this unless you really feel like that connection is being made and, uh, and seek those out. I want to caution you to beware of investments without accountability or collateral. A uh, good in, uh, example of accountability that we have is we use a trustee. Uh, the money doesn't go into our business bank account when it comes into our investment fund. Uh, it goes into a trustee's account and then, then it's dispersed under certain conditions. That's one example of accountability, uh, actually having uh, money and capital tied to an asset uh, is another good form of accountability in, the, in lieu of uh, collateral. And that is something to where you really want to pay close attention to where does your money go? What does it do? How is it governed? Who has the pen that writes the checks? All of those things. Uh, 
is it one person operating? Is it a committee? Uh, is it a company? What are your checks and balances? Be very cautious, be very nosy, uh, get to know that aspect of an operation before you deploy capital in there. And then stay grounded. Uh, have some ba balance uh, between logic and emotion. Uh, you do have to uh, have logic. Your, your, your heart and your brain do need to connect on this. Uh, there's a lot of things that are desired to have happen uh, that can be sold as a warm fuzzy kitten, but at the end of the day, uh, it's just a bad deal. It's just a bad investment. There's no way around it. So uh, you really, if, uh, if, if you're one to always point out the bad side of a deal, uh, find somebody who's uh, you know eager to do something just because it tugs the heartstrings. Um, have your own team uh, that uh, evaluates things. Uh, this can be peers, this can be colleagues, this can be other professionals. Uh, just build out your own team and then have that conversation internally on your own. This is one of the main slides that I'd like to spend time on that if you really wanted to do anything from this whole uh, presentation is just get in a quiet room and a blank pad of paper and go through these questions with yourself. What do I like? What do I dislike? Um, if there's something that you dislike, find the part of it that you do like and do more of that because if you focus on eliminating what you dislike, it's kind of a negative aspect of things. And so uh, I put both of them in there because they can be a good guide, um, but I do like the focus on the positive side of things. Um, where do I have an interest or a passion? Um, if there was just a day, an hour, a week, uh, and you could do nothing, money wasn't an object, geography wasn't an object, you could teleport, uh, you could go anywhere with anyone, do anything. Uh, what would you do? Uh, would you know? What, make it fun, make it productive. Um, expand on these questions, but just use them as your guide. Where do I have an aptitude or an expertise? A good example of this one is uh, there was an individual who worked his whole career as an X-ray technician on a piece of equipment that was discontinued and met him at a conference, asked him about what he was doing, and these discontinued pieces of equipment were being utilized in other countries, and he was using his IRA to buy them and then lease them to hospitals in countries that would still utilize that technology. That investment would be absolutely absurd for anybody but him. So he took his aptitude, his expertise, his career, and he made it a fantastic um, asset-based investment for his IRA, and it was great. Um, where do I have trust? Um, you know, if somebody was going to give you money to do something, what would it be? Uh, maybe you might launch a fund. Maybe you might contribute to or advise a fund or an investment. Uh, this is where if you've done uh, if you're a contractor and you've renovated houses forever and you know your way inside and out, I'm going to have a real good level of confidence loaning you money to fix and flip or to buy and hold or renovate and hold. Um, where do you want to place trust? If you're a contractor and uh, you've done it for years and uh, you know how to evaluate something and you've got somebody who's a young uh, operator that you've been mentoring um, and you can help, you might want to place trust in them because uh, working with your hands, your hands get old. And if you can't do it anymore, you're going to have to hand that baton on. And so you might want to look on where you want to place trust. What type of connection do I want to make in life? This is um, really who are my people? Uh, where do you find that? Um, there's a couple of different places that I want to put out there just as a brainstorming on on finding these things. Uh, I'm, uh, Clay, I'm not sure where I uh, found Advanta in the first place. It might have been on a, an advertisement for an investment, uh, something, you know, so many ways to improve your IRA or anything like that. But we're very, very connected. If you type in a topic on anything in the, uh, on the internet, on your social media, 
um, professionally on LinkedIn, things like that, you're going to find others who are interested in that. Uh, the internet is one of the best and one of the worst things as far as uh, it's so much information, but it's also a great connector. And if there's somebody out there that's teaching on a topic that you like, just like I made myself available from 4.30 to 5.30 for the next couple of weeks for, you know, conversations to brainstorm, uh, this is something to where uh, you can do that as well. And so uh, just, just look out there. Um, and then, Clay, how are we on time? Uh, we're at about 10 till 1, so. Okay, perfect, in. perfect. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, lastly on, on finding your people, it's like where do I want to target and where do I want to impact? And so, uh, hold on one second. This is an example of the younger me. This is why I like doing what I do, is somebody did it for me at a very young age. Uh, the, the young fellow on the top left is me showing uh, a, uh, a sheep that our family raised on the farm. Uh, at the top right, there's my sister handing a check to Clinton Hodges, who is a, one of the largest uh, breeders of Rambouillet fine wool sheep in West Texas. So we hooked that trailer up to the car drove it out there uh, to West Texas. And I remember as a kid, uh, again, I was like uh, probably about seven or eight. And I remember writing a several hundred dollar check to this large breeder of sheep, uh, you know, this large producer. And I was thinking, man, I'm a, I'm a sweet little 4-H kid. How could this guy take this much money from me for this sheep? And I was like, oh, well, I've got a good 4-H project and I'm going to, you know, do this with my family here on the farm and this is what we're going to enjoy. Turns out what he did is he put the best of the best of his show string in a pen and just let us pick and sold it to us for a fraction of what they were worth. And that type of impact investing really made an influence on me and on my life. And then uh, going through that process of raising animals, you can see how I aged through the process there. And, um, and then my sister, uh, she's got the prize banner. Uh, that's actually uh, a you that won grand champion at the state fair um, with a, uh, that animal was born from two of the uh, sheep that we bought from that major breeder. And so I think he got a bigger kick out of losing to us uh, with uh, one of the animals that was uh, bred out of his stock that he sold than if he won himself. And then he also was key in the trade association, not really a trade association, but the breeders association for that particular breed. And then uh, it was a long history. The legacy that you can create with simple things like this um, are very valuable to the lives of many, many people. It was a, a big thing for our family to do and enjoy through the years. And it was something that sparked an interest in me. Moving forward, uh, this is an example of the materials business that I had as a young man. And uh, here in my 20s, uh, right at the top right, you'll see a, a, a fellow with much thinner fitting clothes than now standing in front of a pile of mulch. And what we did is we started a business. My dad, uh, he's right in the um, picture next to me with a, a load of gravel going out. But he had the trucks uh, and the, the land and knew about how to make a good materials business. And so uh, he provided the land uh, for the business. And then I provided the effort on structuring the business and uh, learning the, the operation and the how to's as a young fellow on an entrepreneurial level. Um, you know, going back to the, to the breeding sheep that we had, you know, I was seven, eight years old, I didn't even know what uh, what sex was all about, but I knew a mommy sheep and a daddy sheep had a baby sheep, and I could sell that baby sheep, and, and you know, I had a couple hundred dollars in my hand, and I just looked at my dad and said, how quick till they can do that again, and so, uh, you know, I was hooked being an entrepreneur and a business operator from a young age, and um, uh, this is another example of starting out in life, how I was able to do this. Now, the business that we had was 
one where we could take in brush and wood waste, grind it up, and um, make mulch, compost, soil amendments, things like that. So we were keeping tens of thousands of cubic yards of waste out of the landfill every year. And then that business built from a family business on up to a company that was sold uh, to a large uh, multinational company. You see them uh, putting their sign over our sign uh, right there at the end. Uh, we were able to sell and then operated that for them. And that was good for our family and a nice stepping stone and a nice transition. Uh, bottom left is Glennis. You can tell uh, by the, the, the age of the, the photo by the camera that she's carrying it you don't film with something like that with a with a tape anymore it's all digital but she was passionate about what we were doing and the things we were doing and uh she enjoyed filming uh and doing this was before youtube this was when you would circulate around a vhs tape uh we made a little informational um documentary uh, a little small informational thing they uh, very similar to the classes that we're teaching to the kiddos there uh, about recycling about composting about things like that so it's something that i was passionate in and enjoyed doing um, you see up there where the loader is pulling the load of brush off of the the truck that leads me to a uh, a story about an unintended consequence going back to one of the the cautionary tales that i I explained earlier is there was my business doing at a profit all of this and then on the county level they pulled together grant money so they could do it for free in the same space that I was charging for it and doing it at a profit and uh, the only thing and it was very detrimental to our business and uh, the only thing that I did differently is I unload these guys and they were in and out in five minutes and it was a fantastic fit for them. And so that was one of the competitive advantages that I had, um, that and just being entrenched in the community and doing things like this on a state level, uh, but it was difficult. And so um, it, it's a word of caution, just to you know make sure that you look for those unintended consequences. If you give something away for free, are you going to hurt somebody who's charging for it? And then evaluate, evaluate whether you should or not. Down in the convertible, those aren't just two guys running around that made their way into the slideshow. Those are both uh, uh, municipal employees and state employees. Uh, they were fantastic mentors of mine. And you don't often find the public sector and the private sector, especially the regulatory sector, uh, coming together in such a good way. It was a, a, a good industry. Everybody was supportive and mentors were out there. Now, they dramatically infect, affected my effort by providing good insight, good education, good training. I could go to the, the facility there in Austin and look and learn and tour and learn from Jody. I could go to Scott and with a question about something at any time and he told me if i was about to step in a hole and so those mentor relationships were a valuable investment with their expertise and it was good for me now this is uh, what we're doing now this is the the fund that we're launching uh that's me up in the top left standing in front of a wall made from industrial hemp all we're doing is using the the woody part of the industrial hemp plant as insulation in our homes and i was drawn to it uh, just because it's a superior product and a way to do it um, but it's been fantastic to learn there's been a lot of entrepreneurial energy uh, released since the 2018 farm bill passed legalizing industrial hemp and it's something that i've modified for our investment fund there's an example of the of the house that we're building in the bottom right uh, that's uh, in the middle of the picture. That's my daughter and I out at a workshop uh, where we're uh, learning how to install the industrial hemp as the insulation. And then there's some others where you can see it being blown in or cast in place. And then there's a farm tour where you can learn about things like that. And then that brings us full circle to the environmental impact of the built space to where now we can make a direct connection between soils, to the built space, to the quality of life 
of a tenant that's going to occupy that property. And so uh, that creates jobs. And again, the kids are there in front of the house. It's fun to do this with the family. And um, I hope this has been something that sparks a lot of interest. Uh, I'll make myself available just to spitball ideas, uh, brainstorm things, consult about things, and we hope to uh, share stories with you. Clay, I'll turn it back over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate that. And uh, we do have a couple of questions, so we're we're right at time, so we'll we'll make this a little bit quick, but uh, but we do have a couple of questions. First one is, what are the primary impact characteristics used in the Triple P fund? The primary impact, I am going with the ones that are mathematical. Uh, this is carbon sequestered. Uh, I mentioned the hempcrete that we're using as the insulation. It's a a carbon negative. Uh, uh, building material. And so it's very easy to put that on a scoreboard. We're actually building a graphic where it's like a high school sports scoreboard to where we can have tons of carbon sequestered, all of those things like that. I will tell you that uh, there's a lot of job training that we're doing. Uh, the San Antonio market is very dynamic. It's hard to find uh, really reliable trades. Uh, and so we're going to high schools. We're actually going to uh, prison release uh, programs. And so uh, some of the best um, work that we found were uh, formerly incarcerated individuals that were coming out of being incarcerated right into something where they could learn a trade that was productive. And uh, they were fantastic to work with and uh, formed some good friendships and uh, then uh, coming back into society. It was very rewarding. That's a little bit harder to measure mathematically. So you see both sides of that, where it's like, what can be measured mathematically and what can be measured more anecdotally uh, and then more uh, socially. That's harder to measure. Uh, sometimes you need to do that with uh, where you take and establish a survey to um, put numbers to it. But I like things you can measure with numbers. Terrific. And then this one, Maybe has two prongs to it, but maybe I'm, it says, uh, "Can my IRA invest in the Triple P fund?" So I think I can answer yes on that. Oh yeah, but I, but I do want to. Um, is it is it just accredited investors or non-accredited and accredited? How how does that work? Uh, right now we're starting out, and then as you look at Triple P or any other fund, uh, that's one of the great questions. Right now we're starting out as a 506 B, uh, and that's where you can have both accredited and non-accredited. There's a limit to the non-accredited that we can have, and then we're going to transition that into accredited only. And the reason for that is the laws are such to where uh, you can't do general solicitation on a 506 B fund. And so uh, it's more friends and family, uh, relationships that you've built through, you know, either educational uh, avenues like this, networking conferences, uh, you know, who you play golf with, things like that, who you network with, who are your people. And so if you're looking for where to place funds into something like that, um, find out who's doing those things. Um, maybe you, if, if you work uh, or have a relationship with somebody who's good at business, and uh, you would think that they would be a good fit for doing that. That was a national, uh, natural progression of my real estate brokerage because I was uh, liquidating property for banks. I had investors that wanted to buy those properties. Banks stopped lending. And then so I had to perform weddings between private money and investors and the, the actual property to where it could be at. And so the natural progression of that is to where you can just like pool money uh, and then uh, be able to do that with much greater ease. But the caveat to that is there's some very uh, strict guidelines about how to do that with good cause. You know, uh, anytime money gets pulled and deployed, uh, you want to make sure that uh, that is one of the good functions of the government regulatory uh, effort and to make sure that bad actors don't come in and uh, cause bad things to happen. Okay. Well, I think let's go ahead and wrap it up a little bit. Ray, do you want to uh, mention again, I, I've got our contact information up on the screen. Do you want to mention your availability once more before we sign off here? 
Sure. Uh, I'm on the East Coast time. And so, uh, you know, any day between 4.30 and 5.30 is kind of when I'm making myself available. I'm very flexible outside of that. Um, if you want to set a time to either, you know, have a, um, you know, a Zoom call, a phone call, uh, you want to meet for coffee, things like that. Um, I know things are a little bit strange uh, as we're coming out of uh, or we're still in, you know, pandemic protocols on things like that. But if you want to share uh, and explore any ideas, uh, then that's uh, that's the time that I've made available for that, that 430 to 530 uh, Eastern time for the next couple of weeks. That's great. So I want to thank you again for your time and, uh, you know, putting together the slides and, and the presentation. So thanks oh, thank again. You. It was fun. Yeah, good. I, I stirred up a whole lot of memories when I was going back, <laughs> had my mother pull out the, the pictures from when we were raising lambs. Uh, you know, that was, that was a lot of fun. And then uh, I know my dad will get a kick out of all the old, uh, uh, the trucking pictures, you know, that's, that's one of the uh, favorite impact investing stories is when he was retiring, uh, he was going to sell his truck. And uh, he had one fellow that we were buying stone from that was, uh, they were actually bringing it out of Mexico. And he really wanted to buy dad's truck, had a nice engine, it was set up like he wanted. And then uh, he wanted to pay us in stone because he didn't have the cash to buy the truck. And uh, he asked me what, it, what I thought. And I go, dad, if you watch that truck go across the border into Mexico and you never see it again, your money ahead. And uh, he let it go. Uh, and uh, he took that plunge and uh, they brought every uh, payment. Uh, it was all paid for by barter in stone. And it set them up, uh, that family with that quarry in business. And so, uh, again, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, my parents put me in a position to receive the benefit from impact investing when I was a kid. And then uh, they've put me in a position to both uh, grow as an entrepreneur and also to help others grow as an entrepreneur. And now it's something that I enjoy as well. Uh, you know, my, I, I financed my son's lawn business uh, primarily because I needed my grass cut. I wanted to have him do it. Uh, but you know, he was making payments on the mower and now he owns that thing. And so it's a lot more expensive because I, and he's got the mower paid off. So, uh, all those things are fun. Got it. <laughs> well, thanks again. And thanks everybody for joining us today. And my contact information is also on the screen. Any IRA investing question that you have or an account type question, I'm happy to answer as well. There, there really is a synergy, but I think between self-directed IRA investing and impact investing, because it is, it is your Absolutely. own agenda. Yeah, it's your own agenda and, and you're you're able to put that to work. So anything I can do in service of that, please let me know. Uh, reach out via phone or email. I'm happy to, happy to talk to you about that. So enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for your time. And uh, hopefully it was an educational experience for you and uh, happy investing. Bye, everybody.